So if you've been at Mass at 9am on the last few weeks, you know that we're preparing to baptise a number of adults at the Easter Vigil. And that's really exciting. It's an amazing thing. Uh, they're here today because we're going to do the third scrutiny, the third prayer of preparation with them uh, in preparation for baptism. But I want to take a moment just to say how wonderful and exciting that is. What an extraordinary thing it is that people have come to our parish, in some way have become connected with us, they've done Alpha in particular, and then they've said, you know what, I want to become a Catholic. I want to be baptised. And if you talk to some of them, as I have, they'll say this is not something they expected. This is kind of, you know, life has taken a different direction as they found themselves connected with us. It's a wonderful thing. There are many parishes, perhaps around Australia, where they would love at the Easter Vigil to be baptising adults on, this, on that great day. So it's an exciting thing. One of the things that's really important about it, I think, is for those of us who were baptised when we were babies, you might have heard me describe myself this way, if you're a GCB, that's a good Catholic boy, or you're a GCG, a good Catholic girl, um, there's a risk, you know, that we, I count myself as one of them, that we can just take some of this for granted. You know, there's that saying that familiarity breeds contempt. If this is all you've ever known, if you're used to it, if you've been a GCB or a GCG for your, most of your life, ever since you were a baby, you were baptised, then you can take this for granted. And there's something amazing and wonderful when we watch people preparing for baptism who are making an adult choice to do so. Nobody's making it on their behalf. They're not babies who can't decide for themselves. They're choosing this. There's something about that that should and does speak to us, I think, who are GCBs and GCGs, people who've been used to this, who've grown up with it. And there are others in the congregation today who maybe you've were baptised as a baby and you're back at Mass for the first time in just a little while. It's been recent, a new thing that you've been coming back. For others, you're not baptised and you're watching all of this with some interest, perhaps as you're already doing Alpha with us as well. I want all of us to pay really careful attention to really watch what's happening over these next few weeks because we're getting really close now. And the reason why I'm talking about that is that the readings that we've had the last two weeks and now this week are all designed, they're all focused upon baptism. And in fact, then the Easter Vigil, so on the Saturday night, so the Saturday, we, we call it Holy Saturday Evening, the Easter Vigil Mass, all of the readings, remember, if you've ever been to one, there's a chance you might have been by mistake. Last, last night I said at Mass, this is to the, East, to the vigil crowd, this is the one Mass that you don't come to the Easter Vigil because you know there's long readings and you think, oh, there's a football game afterwards or something like that, right? It's a big Mass, there's extra readings, but those readings are all focused towards baptism. They all have the theme, if you like, of how God uses water through the Scriptures to ultimately culminate in baptism, in the gift of salvation, poured out when we are immersed, that's what the word baptism means, when we're immersed into the water. So all of, all of what we're doing is actually leading towards the Easter Vigil. Those of you who are going to be baptised at Easter, everything is preparing towards this moment. We're absolutely at the pointy end of the season, as the football coaches would say. It's all leading to this. So, the last two weeks we've had some of the symbols of baptism being alluded to and referred to in the gospel. The first of those was the story of the woman at the well. And we're told that, remember, there's a whole conversation that she has with Jesus about living water. And then I said to you a couple of weeks ago that what happens then, a few chapters later in John's gospel, we're told that the living water is the Holy Spirit. The living water is the Holy Spirit. And the woman says, give me some of that water always. She couldn't have known what she was asking for, what she was about to receive, 
But that's exactly the right prayer. Give me some of that water always. Because you see, the greatest gift of our baptism is God. When we're baptized, we receive God. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is actually present and dwelling within us because of our baptism. Those of you who are preparing for baptism, that's massive and huge. To the GCBs and the GCGs like me who attempted to take that for granted, who attempt, attempted to feel like this is just business as usual, this is normal, it's not. God dwells within you. The Holy Spirit has come to dwell within you and that should make a difference. We should know. We should notice. And if you've been coming to church and you listen to me say this now and you're thinking, I don't know what kind of difference the Holy Spirit makes, ask. Because God wants to show you that he's with you and within you and working in you. What's the greatest sign of the Holy Spirit's presence? I would say it's this. It's that there's a love that you experience that is the very love of God that wells up into a joy. The great sign that you have experienced, encountered the Holy Spirit in your life is joy because you know that you're loved. You know that you're loved unconditionally by God. Can you grow into that experience? Absolutely. Does God want to show you more of that? Definitely. But that's what baptism is for, that we would receive the gift of God's own spirit. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you and in me. Those who are about to be baptised, I hope you're getting really excited about that because it is awesome and huge. Wonderful. Amazing. Last week, we had the story of the man who was born blind and that alludes to one of the most important other ancient words for baptism or ancient images for baptism and that is that baptism is an illumination. The blind man learns to see. Jesus, the light of the world, opens his eyes. And, of course, light is a crucial symbol of baptism. The moment over there you can see our Paschal candle, our Easter candle. We're going to get a new one at the Easter vigil. And this, at the risk of telling tales for people who haven't experienced it yet, we'll start in darkness. There'll be a fire outside and the one new Easter candle will be lit. And as, we, as that Easter candle comes into the church... All of these other, all of our candles, the ones we're holding, will be lit until the place is ablaze. That's because baptism is about illumination. To have faith in Jesus means, first of all, that we see God in a new way. We see God through the lens, if you like, of Jesus, through the lens of his love for us. But we also see Jesus, we also see the world through that light too. That we see everything else differently because of Jesus. It's not just that we see God in a new way. We learn to see the world, as it were, through the lens of Jesus. What makes Jesus weep, what fills him with joy, what he's passionate about, what makes him angry. These are the things that we learn to see and we learn to see our world in a new light because of that. One of the great symbols of baptism then is that we are to be enlightened. And then that brings us to today's gospel, which is the story of Lazarus. And that brings us to this incredible moment. It's, it's actually an ancient tradition that on the last Sunday before Palm Sunday, we would have the gospel of Lazarus. Part of that is semi-chronological. As John would have it, it's Lazarus's raising from the, being raised from the dead that actually triggers the final conflict with the authorities that ends up in Jesus' crucifixion. But there's something else that's going on. It's more than chronological. Because as Jesus says in the gospel today, I am the resurrection and the life. In his raising of Lazarus from death, he's promising, he's giving us a foretaste, a shadow of the great gift that the gift of the Holy Spirit and being enlightened culminates in, which is that death has been conquered forever. Human beings are so deeply scared of dying. Death comes as something that shapes our behaviours in ways that we don't even realise. But every time somebody yearns to be successful at the expense of others, it's because they want their life to last. They're scared of dying and they want their, their life to have an enduring consequence. 
Every time somebody decides that they're going to put someone down in order to exalt themselves up, it's ultimately because they're scared of dying and they actually want their life to continue and endure. We don't do that consciously, but our lives are shaped by the fact that we're scared that this is all there is. Death comes as a great obstacle that kind of renders everything else flat and short. But the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is that he, risen from the dead himself, actually conquers and defeats death. Jesus dies our death, but the glorified, risen life that he leads means that we, in time, after our own death, will know that our life continues and endures forever. And it means you don't have to put somebody else down to exalt yourself. It means that you don't have to try and accumulate goods in an effort to live forever. It means that you don't have to try and try and try to do things that actually prop yourself up because you're scared that this is all there is. The promise of Christianity is that we have a life of love that endures for eternity. I want to stress here that that means that what happened to Lazarus is a bit different to what will happen to us and what happened to Jesus. You see, to be technical about it, Lazarus was resuscitated. The scriptures make it really clear that he was dead, okay? And he's raised from the, from the dead in that sense. But Lazarus will die, does die again, right? Jesus dies once, but when he is resurrected, he lives a life for eternity. He'll never die again. You and I, when we die, we will die. But when we are raised to life with Jesus, we will not die again. The story of Lazarus is a foretaste, it's a symbol, it's a promise that Jesus will defeat death forever. That's what we celebrate at Easter. The way that he did that, the way that he accomplished that, had to be by dying for our sake first. But his risen life means that our life actually is not ended at bodily death, that we shall be raised to a new life with him, that we'll be able to say with him that he truly is the resurrection and the life, that the love that he offers us is not for this time only, but endures into, continues into eternity. So our our readings over these last three weeks have, have drawn us, if you like, to reflect more deeply upon the mystery, the significance, the importance of our baptism. For those of you who are preparing to be baptised, this is what you're about to be immersed into. For those of us who are GCBs and GCGs, may the witness of our friends who've chosen to be baptised as adults challenge us in the best possible sense of that. Not to take this for granted, not to assume that we know what we're doing here, not to assume that this is all there is because God wants more for you. He wants more for you. And for those of you who are not baptised, those of you who perhaps have been away from the church for a long time and you've been back for a little while, this is the invitation that we put before you, that there's more here than you have dreamed or imagined of. In this simple, ordinary thing that we do, God is at work in an almighty, powerful way. With that, I'd like to invite those who who are preparing for baptism to come forward for their third and final scrutiny. Um, Can your godparents and sponsors come forward too, please? You might just stand behind your... uh, behind the elect... Elect of God, I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Let us pray for these elect whom God has chosen. May the grace of the sacraments conform them to Christ in his passion and resurrection and enable them to triumph over the bitter fate of death. That they may ponder the word of God in their hearts and savour its meaning more fully day by day, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may learn to know Christ, who came to save what was lost. Let us pray to the Lord. 
Lord, hear our prayer. That they may humbly confess themselves to be sinners. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That they may humbly confess themselves to be sincerely reject everything in their lives that is displeasing and contrary to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the Holy Spirit who searches every heart may help them to overcome their weakness through his power. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the same Holy Spirit may teach them to know the things of God and how to please him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That their families also may put their hope in Christ and find peace and holiness in him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That we ourselves in preparation for Easter feast may seek a change of heart, give ourselves to prayer, and persevere in our good works. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That throughout the whole world, whatever is weak may be strengthened, whatever is broken, restored, whatever is lost, found, and what is found, redeemed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our family members and parishioners who have died, including Ray Hans, Barry Sydenham, Teresa Vittoria, Salvador, Alana McBride, Rally Maria, and Michaela Lovett. May their souls be received into the glorious presence of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father of life and God, not of the dead but of the living, you sent your Son to proclaim life, to snatch us from the realm of death and lead us to the resurrection. Free these elect from the death-dealing power of the spirit of evil, so that they may bear witness to their new life in the risen Christ, for he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 